Hi everyone, I'm Sariel Filias, the Specialist Learning and Development at CEREC, and on behalf of all the CEREC team, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar. Today, we are delighted to have Dave Redekop and Michael Houston live with us. Dave and Michael are here to discuss the key learnings based on the recent CEREC published book called Strengthening Mental Health Through Effective Career Development. But before our presenter gets started, we would like to take a few moments to introduce you to CEREC and share some housekeeping notes with you. CEREC is a charitable organization that focuses on education and research in career counseling and career development in Canada. Right now, we recognize that the current situation is bringing drastic changes in our life and including in the career development community with a lot of conferences and face-to-face -face training being either postponed or canceled. So we want to continue as much as we can to provide you with remote learning opportunity like this webinar today. So at the end of today's webinar, we will ask you a few questions in the webinar survey in order for us to better understand what your learning needs are right now and how we can best support you. So thank you in advance for your answer. Now, a couple of housekeeping notes for today's webinar. If during today's webinar you have any questions or any comments, please enter them in the question box you see on your screen. We'll have a Q&A session where Dave and Michael will address all of your questions at the end of the webinar. Now, as you can imagine, we are all likely doing this webinar series under a new work from home scenario, and you might experience technical issues during today's session due to a low internet speed. But in any case, be reassured that we'll email you the recording of today's webinar along with a presentation slide later today. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenters. Dave Redekop is the president of the Life Role Development Group and has been involved in a career development since 1988. He has received provincial and national awards in career development and is widely recognized in Canada as a top leader in the field. Dave holds a PhD in Educational Psychology from the University of Alberta. Our second presenter, Michael Houston, had been involved in the career development field as a counselor, practitioner, trainer, and counselor educator since the early 1990s. He's a registered psychologist, counselor, and associate professor at Mount Royal University in Calgary. CEREC was thrilled to partner with Dave and Michael on the publication of this great guide, and we are pleased to have them here today deliver their webinar and share key learning from the book. So over to you guys. Great. Let me just switch my screen here and oops, move something over, which just disappeared on me. Sorry. There we go. And here we are. Uh, thank you, Cyrielle. Um, and thanks to Sarek for, for putting this on and for helping us with the book. Um, we're just thrilled and actually quite honored to be doing this, um, especially at a time like this when um, this is a, a very important topic, unfortunately, with the COVID thing going on. But what's so interesting is that um, it, it might be um, the time in history where more people are talking about one thing than any other time. And, and you'll see we have, we have a bit of a geographic theme. I have a map behind me and, and uh, I'm going to get into a map uh, right now actually and tell you a little bit about why, uh, why we're doing this and, and, and what our intentions are around looking at career development and mental health. Um, Michael has been looking at this for a long time. And a couple of years ago, we got together um, to talk about this in terms of where the mental health movement was going. And what we were seeing was a bit worrisome, that the mental health movement was gaining great momentum, which was fantastic. But it was sometimes at the expense of career development. And it became clear that as a field, we had not made clear where our contribution was to mental health. And for some people, it's obvious we make this contribution. And for other people, they don't see it at all. And somewhere in between is what Michael and I have been working on for the last couple of years. 
and it is um it's a journey it's um an exploration and it's one that we're not doing alone and in fact we're we're going to whoops we're going to invite you uh to join us on this journey and let me give you a little background we we were asked to write a paper for the british journal of guidance and counseling on you know career development and mental health a couple of years ago and and we did and as we explored that we started putting together a, a workshop knowing that there, there's lots that's unknown here that we don't have all the answers that's for sure um and and that there's lots of research to be done lots of thinking to be done lots of model making to be done and for us what was really helpful was we started doing these workshops and and we're able to do them in alberta which is where we're from which is in the western part of canada and we um, did a whole bunch of workshops um, in Alberta and Saskatchewan that you can see on the map. And then had the great fortune of being invited to Australia through the um, Career Education Association of Victoria to do a couple of conferences there. And what was fantastic about all this was then we could really see what our practitioners doing, um, what are they thinking about, and of course, we asked them questions and, and we were able to get all sorts of answers that, that helped us start putting together um, uh, evidence for how career development affects mental health um, and not proof. And we'll talk about that later, but evidence and, and it helped us think through how to package together some of the research we were digging up about career development and mental health and what's uh what's happening now even though we've written a book on it um there's still an awful lot of work to do and that's why we're just so thrilled that um on this next map you can see this is um people who've registered for this webinar outside of north america and as you can see there's there's a lot of interest outside of of north america and, and the north america map is quite full um this is a pressing issue and it's a pressing, it was a pressing issue before COVID, but you'll see um, as, as we go through the, the um, mental health connections to career development, you'll see that um, the things we need to do are becoming obviously far more pressing during COVID and, and after the, the COVID pandemic is, is somehow managed. And so, um, as I started, you know, I said some people think, well, the career development mental health connection is obvious, and other people, you know, uh, don't even think about it. And and I think what we'd like to start with is a little poll question for you, um, that just asked you over the past few years, uh, how often have you been aware of the mental health implications of your work? And we'll give you a minute or so to um, respond to that, and and we'll see what comes up. Yeah, and so we have here, um, okay, very few of you, 1% have not thought about it at all, 12% not very often, 48% often, and 39% all the time. So the majority of you are, are thinking about this, and now what we have to look at is what are you doing with, with um, the, the things you're thinking about, and, and how are you making that explicit, how are you making it concrete? and uh yeah doing it in such a way that you can improve that part of your practice or the outcomes of your practice but also maybe communicate that as well so um oh, i have lost the ability to use my slides hang on one sec there we go let me give you an overview of what we're going to do and then we're going to get right into it um what we're going to start with is sort of a a summary of the research in a way but it's more think about this first part the career development and mental health framework as an articulation of what you already do and the outcomes you already achieve from a career development point of view most of you are thinking about the mental health implications of your work what this framework does is is help spell out what those implications are 
that just by virtue of being in a career development practice, uh, that, that you, the mental health outcomes that you are achieving. Then we're going to move to um, looking at career development intervention and stress, and stress being sort of the, the, the continuity piece that ties together all intervention in career development with mental health outcomes. And then we need to look at, at practice and, and kind of tying together the ethics of what we do um, with, with uh, the skills and skills that we already have. And you'll, you'll see um, that this, you know, there won't be shocking new skills that we're going to introduce you to. Uh, there, there are skills that are already in your in your kit, and then we need to look at evaluating mental health outcomes because even though the mo most of you are, are are thinking about mental health outcomes, you're aware of them. Um, we found very few organizations or or practitioners who are explicitly measuring them, and this becomes a problem because we also need to think about communicating mental health outcomes. Who needs to know that? that career development work produces uh, mental health outcomes. And so we'll, we'll talk about communication, and but we really wanna leave time for, for questions and answers. Um, so let's get to the framework. And again, the framework here just maps out what you already do. But it starts with um, defining mental health, maybe a little differently than how you're used to it. You know, uh, in Canada, if you say to the general layperson, um, you know, uh, if you say something about we're working on mental health, what they hear is, oh, so you're working on mental illness. And there is this default conception um, that mental health and mental illness are, are on either ends of a single continuum. Corey Keyes um, came up with a model in the mid 90s that, that's really gaining some traction, that, but you might not have heard of it, uh, called the dual or two continuum model that sees um, mental illness uh, on a different axis than mental health. And what's lovely about this is you can see from the diagram that you could have high mental health and high mental illness, and you all know somebody who's got that combination. Like everybody, knows somebody who's who's grappling with the uh, effects of a mental illness and yet manages their lives in such a way that they're productive and 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 happy and and uh, in relationships and that sort of thing um and what this model will do for us as you'll see particularly when we get into ethics is it takes away that fear that many practitioners have of not wanting to mess with mental illness because they think it's out of bounds. And it is in a way, like we're not claiming to be um, able to treat mental illness, but what we will claim is that we can help mental health quite a bit. And by virtue of helping with mental health, uh, we can help the client better grapple with mental illness issues they may have. So that's the starting point for um, the framework. So, and here's the framework right here. And it, what it shows is we've just collected the effects of career development work, um, put them into five categories, and then all of these categories tie to mental health. And I'm quickly going to, to take you through those. Um, whoops. Um, when career development happens, and it happens well, one of the obvious things that happens uh, occurs is our life changes, right? There are life effects. So clients come to us and quite often it's because they want work or they want better work. And that that's typically, you know, how clients see us, that, that we're involved with helping them get work or improve their work and either then get an income or, or improve their income. And at some level, they also know that, you know, we help with social identity that it's, it's easier to be at a party when you somebody asks you, you know, what do you do for a living? And you can answer. Um, and they probably think a little less about it, but they're going to think more about it after COVID, that um, when we help them get work, we're also helping them with ro routine and pattern in their lives. And the reason these things are listed here is they are all known contributors to mental health. And, and, and there's lots of research on pretty much all of these. And these are the most obvious uh, connections our field makes to the mental health 
outcomes of our clients. And I'm, because it's the most obvious, I'm gonna skip right through it and, and go to the next set, ability effect. Now, most of us don't, you know, do all the work for clients, right? We're not writing their resumes and writing their cover letters and going to interviews for them. No, we're, we're, we're actually helping them develop some skills, some, some competencies and, and acquire or, or improve their resourcefulness to manage their own career development. And so when we're doing our jobs well, um, we see career management skills, improving self-management skills, improving employability or, or workability skills, improving. And, and the generic transferable skills uh, improve as well. Now, what's interesting about this is these also connect to mental health outcomes. Uh, and there are a set, um, a category, I guess, of mental health outcomes that, that are sometimes labeled, labeled mastery of the environment that fall into most definitions of mental health. And, and that's where the ability effects uh, contribute directly to the mental health of our clients. But they also lead to self-perception effects. Um, when our clients get work and, and they get an income, and when they start developing skills and becoming uh, more resourceful, they start seeing themselves differently. And of course, if you're a practitioner, you see this every day, right? They, they start seeing that they can get things done, self-efficacy, they start, feeling um, not a social sense of identity, like a label, but more an internal sense of who they are and, and, and you know, what they're on this earth for and what they want to contribute, that, that sense of identity, their values. They also uh, have greater hope. And, and hope in this sense is that I, perception of being able to cope no matter what the future brings. So, um, Hope isn't about you know, wishing for a better future. Hope is saying, well, okay, I don't know what the future holds, but I'll be okay. We also, as we help people get work and, and develop abil their abilities, uh, we see that they start um, creating more meaning for themselves, purpose for themselves. And of course, that's part of our intervention as well, right? Is, is helping them see what it is they wanna do. And then lastly, more agency, more locus of control, more sense that they own their lives and they they own uh, excuse me <clears throat> they they own uh, the process uh, of making decisions. Now this leads us to poll question number two, um, and we've talked to lots of practitioners about this, and we're very curious. This isn't um, a, a, you know a keep you busy question. <laughs> we we really want to know the answer to this. When you think about your work. Um, which of the self-perception changes uh, does your work make the greatest uh, impact? And again, we'll give you 30 seconds or so. All right, this is interesting. So self-efficacy that your clients can um, have a sense that they can get things done, that they can solve problems is 16%. Um, the highest is hope, perceptions of coping. And this is interesting. We're gonna talk about that a bit more. And meaning of course, and purpose, uh, that makes all sorts of sense. And you put those two together and we're up to 65%. Um, and then we go to self-efficacy and then identity, this, uh, this sense of solidifying who they are and how they see themselves, and then uh, agency or, or locus of control. Oh, that's excellent. Thank you for that. Um, this, sorry, this, um, yeah, this is interesting because as I mentioned before, what I'm mapping out is what the research says, basically you're already doing. And, and, uh, the question then becomes, well, how do we get better at what we're doing, not just from a career development point of view, 
Um, but what could we change in our practice that would get more of these outcomes as we proceed? All right, I'm quickly going to go over the last two uh, sets of effects. And, and the reason I'm, is uh, this is where the research starts getting fuzzier, um, but I think it's super important. So I'll be very quick. When our client's self-perceptions change, they start seeing the world differently. And, and you know, when, when, when they have a purpose and they see that they can be efficacious and all those sorts of things, um, they have an intention, right? And, and a psychologist colleague of mine says, intention creates attention. And I, I think he's right that when we have an intention, uh, we start seeing, um, we start seeing things that we couldn't see before because we were too busy worried about ourselves or we weren't focused enough or whatever. But the other thing is, and I'm, I'm going backwards on the list on the right, um, we start getting a bit more optimistic because we start seeing opportunities that actually align with us. They're not just generic opportunities. Oh yeah, there's a big world of work out there. No, these are opportunities that have something to do with me and my identity. We see cognitive bandwidth going up. And that's just the, the ability of, for the brain, basically, to uh, be freed up to think about opportunities rather than thinking about other things like fear, anxiety, who I am, you know, why can't I find a job, et cetera. And that's also tied to uncertainty tolerance, that people see, uh, make or, or uh, are able to handle uncertainty with less anxiety. Now, these things happen. And as they happen, and this is where the evidence is weak on the positive side, it's pretty strong on the negative side, but is that as our clients see opportunity differently, opportunity sees them differently. And so this is where, you know, you're an employee in an organization and you start taking control of your own career and you see options. Well, all of a sudden the people above you start noticing and they say, hey, do you want to go on this project? Do you want to come to me with this meeting? Um, do, do you want to go on this course? That the world around you starts seeing you differently when, um, uh, when you see it differently. And that, of course, leads then to new life effects, which then uh, starts the whole cycle over again. So very quickly, these five sets of effects you're already achieving, uh, we show them to you so you can pat yourself on the back so that you can recognize them, that so you can feel good about your work and that you can immediately start thinking about, well, how can I get a little bit more of these in the work I'm already doing? But when we want to look at mental health directly, the common thread is um, stress. And I'm going to turn things over to Mike and he's going to talk about career development intervention. And there we go. Okay, and Dave, you're running my uh, you're running my slides, and so we have to do this dance between our two cities, and, yep. it's, uh, and that's good. So one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, interesting things uh, uh, that Dave pointed out, he referenced in in his part of the talk there, was that uh, um, mental health, positive mental health, uh, definition definitionally is is uh, aligned with all of the outcomes that you're already creating as a career development practitioner. But one of the uh, one of the other mechanisms that you can look at, and and when we've talked about it, we think it's almost uh, too simple uh, an explanation for things. But it's one of the ways that our work as career development practitioners um, helps helps to support clients' positive mental health. And so in this section, we're going to talk about stress as a mechanism um, or as an explanatory mechanism that explains how career development is a support for positive mental health. And the reason we'll do that is because as a practitioner, it gives you a leverage point for talking about the, the value that you add in, in terms of supporting positive mental health, positive mental health outcomes. So I'll go on to the next uh, slide there. And here, just, just, um, just briefly thinking about stress as the, as the reaction that we're all familiar with. Um, that has uh, behavioral elements and uh, cognitive elements and physiological elements and and it's a reaction to perceptions about coping and uh, and uh, uh, we could get into the weeds with a lot of that but it, it's a it's an unavoidable uh, event in our lives 
and yet it's related to mental health and and reducing it or finding ways to reduce it um, also supports positive mental health and the, just the point there at the bottom of the slide is just is around the importance of perception right so most most of our worries end up not end up not being realized but we still respond to them with this primitive mechanism that that um, has us reacting in particular ways and that affects our affects our mental health so i'll go on to the next slide Dave. and so this is a here's a model that we've adapted um, uh, with uh, with jack dobbs we worked on this uh, jack dobbs a colleague of mine from mount royal and it's it's an adaptation of brian hebert's framework for managing stress and uh, and how it's adapted here just to look at career demands as uh, as being an opportunity to intervene with stress and so just walking through the model um, um we're faced with a question am i experiencing career related stress and of course if the answer is no then there's there's no problem at all um we we don't we don't we don't we don't need to address that but if the answer is yes then we have uh, options for interventions and so the first option is to look at reducing demand, right? So one thing about, about, about the model is, is stress is always about uh, the perception um, that the demands we're facing exceed our capacity to cope with them. And if there's significant demands, um, uh, our stress is elevated, if we perceive them to be significant, or if we perceive our coping resources to be minimal. So the the first option for intervening with stress is always this. Is there, is there a way that we can reduce some of the demands that we're facing? And then our second option uh, is, is to look at increasing coping skills. So if we can't reduce demands or we don't want to reduce demands, then a question we can ask is, is there a way that we can uh, improve our client's capacity for coping with the demands that they're facing? And, and this is, uh, properly this is where career development practitioners spend most of their time in helping their clients to cope better with the demands that they're facing and uh and then the third option is to focus on stress management itself and this is probably where we when we read literature on managing stress or if we 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 consult people on how to help us feel less stress it's usually around how to manage our stress response and it's it's all the things that people who care about you would recommend that you do. So it's eating better and getting sleep and and uh, getting exercise and then learning how to reduce your your physiological arousal. So to to uh, do things uh, uh, like yoga and practicing mindfulness and meditation and things like that. So the the uh, the framework actually gives you a way for thinking about your client as someone who's experiencing. Uh, um, stress and then looking at it from the framework of career demands and considering is there any way I can help this person to uh, to better manage the relationship between the demands and their ability to cope and and probably as as career practitioners you don't spend as much time helping your clients to manage stress but maybe occasionally you do that you actually um, would tell your clients well make, make sure you get sleep uh, be, before your job interview or make sure that you're getting exercise as well so I'll go on to the next overhead, and we'll just look at all three of these together. And um, and the the purpose of thinking about it this way is just to focus on the value that um, that stems from your work as a career development practitioner. So the first column there uh, is focusing on reducing demands. And as a as a as a practitioner, maybe you're maybe you're listening to the kinds of things your clients are dealing with, and you're helping them to consider is there you know, facing all of the things that you're facing right now, is there anything that you might get rid of? So you might actually deal tangibly with the demands they're facing. But I think we also do it by um, by normalizing and validating the concerns that our that our clients are facing. And so the classic example there in my work would be um, uh, thinking about uh, post-secondary students and the worry and the pressure they feel when they don't. Um, know what they want to study and the relief that they get uh, when they know that uh, not only is there not something terribly wrong with them but in fact they're actually part of the majority of students on campus they 
they don't know what they want to do and it's actually okay and there's a there's a there's a way to move forward with that and as a result of that we get stress reduction okay and then uh, if if clients do things just uh, looking at the right side of the screen if clients do things to actively manage their stress so if they learn skills and they take on activities that help them to manage their physiological reaction uh, like exercise or getting sleep or, or practicing mindfulness um, there's stress reduction there as well and uh, then if we look at the center column and this is really this is the domain that career development practitioners function in and and so our, our work and if you think about um, just back to, to uh, what Dave was talking about, the, the uh, effects of career development. Um, this is, it's the domain that career practitioners work in. And, and what you're actually doing is you're helping uh, clients to build skills and coping resources that help them to manage uh, the significant demands that they're facing. And so with that, like the other avenues, you, you produce stress reduction, clients feel less stressed. Um, because they have the perception that they're going to be able to cope with the demands they're facing. Um, but in addition to feeling less stressed, uh, your work produces all these other outcomes. And so there's a, the a skill development that helps them to manage demands now and in the future. Uh, but also there's, um, if you, you think about, uh, about some of the terms, there, there, there's a direct link to positive mental health for uh, self-esteem and for achievement and for um, uh, coping on into the future. It's just the same thing as hope. Um, so your your work produces all those outcomes as well. So I'll go into the next slide, Dave. Okay. And uh, and uh, actually, I don't need to spend too much time with it. But but when you think of increasing coping skills, it's sort of obvious, right? It's all the things that you do with your clients every day to help them manage the, the significant career demands that they're facing. And I'll go on, Dave, to the next one. Um, so so uh, this, is, this is kind of pulling it all together. Um, uh, this is, a, this is a, how, we, how we portrayed this model in the book. Um, you, you can frame um, the, uh, your ability to help clients deal with the stress in terms of helping them to reduce demand, um, sometimes by normalizing, and that actually increases their perception of coping. You can uh, help them to uh, reduce stress or to can encourage them to take on activities that uh, help them to manage their stress. But the majority of your work is helping them to um, develop skills. And if you look at the green box in the, in the middle there, what they get out of that is, is um, this change in perception that they actually are going to be able to cope with the demands that they're facing. And then the red letters there, if you can see that, um, actually produces a perception about future coping, which is the same as hope, right? Which is what you all recognize that you do in your work. You actually help your clients to feel more hopeful about the future. You actually help them um, to see that they're gonna be able to cope with the important demands that they're facing in the future. And with all of those, you get, um, uh, you get stress reduction. And as a result of all of that, you support positive mental health. And then just briefly, um, we'll show you a model here that kind of that ties it all together. And this is way too much to talk about in, in a minute. Um, but if you, you notice there, it's the same model that we just looked at turned on its side. But what we've done here is we've linked skill development. It's the, uh, the box in the, uh, in the lower uh, left-hand corner with uh, all of the life effects, or all of the, all of the uh, effects of career development. And, uh, and all of these, um, our, our career intervention reduces demands and it increases coping. And as a result of all of that, uh, it supports positive mental health. And, and then, so just some, some key ideas here to, uh, to uh, wrap up uh, talking about stress. So, so, uh, um, I'll just see here that career concerns are probably among the most um, worrisome concerns that people face in their lives and helping our clients to cope with them uh, does much to support their positive mental health. 
Um, stress is amplified if uh, the demands are considered important, which they are in the case of, uh, of uh, career concerns. And uh, um, if, if clients worry that they're not going to be able to manage their career concerns uh, going on into the future, then they do feel stress. And as a result, they, they suffer significant uh, uh, mental health consequences. Uh, it's amplified if coping is overly challenging, right? So uh, see a lot of a lot of this uh, right now with the economic circumstances in Canada for sure and around the world. Um, but it's a competitive market out there, and and uh, and uh, it is overly challenging, and as a result, it is stressful or more stressful than it would be otherwise. And then coping is also uh, or stress is also uh, uh, increased if clients don't know how to cope and we we see this all this is where where we work right that we we help our clients to uh to actually to uh, figure out how to do this how to manage their stressors um uh one one thing to remember in all of this is that demands are additive so clients aren't just facing uh career concerns that they've got um they've got financial demands and they've got uh, um aging parents and they uh, uh, have other demands in their lives and all of these work together. So anything we can do to help them reduce their demands is going to help them also uh, feel less stressed. And then one last point in all of this is um, sometimes we get results as soon as we've, we've helped our, our clients to realize that they're gonna be able to cope. So, so stress, um, stress reduction actually doesn't happen once we could, once we achieve the result of the of of our, our work with them, once they have the job, or once they're secure secure in their career path, but stress reduction happens as soon as there's a perception uh, that they're going to be able to cope. So as soon as soon as as they realize that what you're going to do for them is actually going to help them to cope with the demands that they're facing. Um, so just to to tie all that together, I've talked about about stress here. And the, the reason we've done that is it, it as a practitioner, it gives you a point of leverage for talking about uh, in a tangible way uh, what your work does to support your client's mental health. So moving on from that, and I'm just going to look at our time here. Um, Dave, I've got I've got three minutes. <laughs> That's for, okay. More okay. I can take okay. short. Um so then one well i and and much of this i i had the thought that we could could uh just focus on some of the key outcomes of this but uh talking about interpersonal skills what we'll do here is we'll um we'll talk about them generically and then we're going to focus on one tool that you can start to use with your clients to bring um, um mental health awareness into into the work that you're doing with them for yourself and for your clients as well we'll go on to the next slide dave and um, and so interpersonal skills. One of the one of the things we'll say is that you use all of them all the time. And even if you haven't if you haven't spent a lot of time uh, being trained, or if you're, or um, or if uh, if you haven't if you're not aware of this model, one of the things we know is that most most people are using the skills in some way, even if they don't identify them uh, uh, as part of a particular model. And uh, we break them down into to three main categories. There's your questioning skills, uh, the kind of the things you do to engage your clients and gather information and to, uh, and to help them to start to think about things and to in, engage in a deep way with their career concerns. And there's reacting skills. And these are the skills we use to let our clients know that we hear what they're saying, we hear what their concerns are, and uh, that, we, that we get them. And then the category we're going to spend our time on today, just to talk about structuring skills, we actually don't get um, a lot of airtime uh, in in skill training programs, but it provides a powerful tool. And when we think about this, this is the skill, the structuring skills that most that, that afford the most opportunity to include mental health awareness in your work as a career development practitioner. And uh, and uh, I'm going to I'll move on to the next. The next over we're going to talk about one of those skills so go ahead dave oh there we go um so the uh the skill um the skill we want to spend our time on today is the structuring skill and uh, the function of structuring skills is to create a meaningful context right so to to give the clients um 
uh, an awareness of what's happening in the session and uh, and how how uh, that's important and relevant for them and maybe to link them to to other resources as well so so the main skill we use for that is information giving and it's a statement a counselor statement that happens during the session or at the beginning of the session end of a session and it's to provide the client with information that's relevant to the context they're experiencing so we might teach them about models uh, or we'll talk to them about resources or maybe we talk to them about the evidence as well and one of the one of the main ways it can be used uh, and and how, how we see it as being powerful for career intervention as a support for positive mental health is that information giving um, it gives you a, gives you a direction for teaching your clients about the relationship between career development and mental health so on to the next one Dave and then let's give it so an example that you might use at the start of a session and uh, you have a you have a bunch of text we want to show you but I'm, I'm just going to say the kind of thing that you want to say at the start of a session would be to say you know um, something that reminds your clients that you're a, you're a career practitioner and you're going to be focusing on their career development concerns um, and something as simple as saying but we know that there's a strong relationship between career concerns and all the other parts of our lives and in fact is uh, our well-being as well and so let's just let's look at the example Dave and the reason we we did this is we we didn't want to having to read through all of this but here's an example it says practitioner says we've discussed confidentiality and I'll just mention that I'm a career development practitioner. My main focus will be on the career development concerns you want support with. And just to say, we know that other parts of our lives are strongly impacted by career decisions and activities and vice versa. It's difficult to make effective career decisions without considering our whole life. So an example at the start of the session. And then on to the middle, and we can also use information giving to provide evidence about uh, about the relationship and so we can use inf information giving for that um, to provide evidence or to normalize concerns and so um, here's an example of a practitioner responding to job loss and um, and uh, if we have the evidence at hand we can say something like this uh, one of the things we know for certain about job loss is that it's stressful for most people and that over time it can take its toll on our mental health Right. And so that's just it's a lot of evidence about, uh, about just about what we what we had there about the relationship between job loss and uh, and uh, mental health. But we can share that with our clients and it has the effect of reducing the demand of uh, it's all me and it's only me. Okay, Dave, and on to the next one. And then uh, something we can do during session. And, and so one, one of the things about even using the words mental health and to talk about well-being in your sessions is it might lead to bigger conversations and this is i guess this is the ethical um, part of this or the ethics part would be to use information giving to reinforce a boundary to normalize and also to link our clients to other resources and um, so here's the example and i'll just it's a it's this one's wordy and i'm just waiting for it there and so here's a, a practitioner working with John, and uh, and there's a few elements here. Uh, John, just to be clear, and so I'm not working outside my area of expertise. I want us to remember that I'm a career development practitioner, and in my role, I'm going to focus primarily on career concerns, on doing what I usually do uh, with the clients that I that I that have been through similar job loss experiences. And this work is about helping them learn and build skills that will equip them to manage their career demands. Another thing we know for certain is that taking this approach, even though we're not focusing on mental health concerns, that it will lead to less stress, more hope for the future, and other positive mental health outcomes. However, uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a mental health practitioner. If you want or need additional support with mental health concerns, I have a list of resources I can connect you to. And on to the next, Dave. So, so uh, what, one thing on all of that is just to remind ourselves of our role as, uh, as career practitioners. And it's really our, our focus is always gonna be on our clients' career concerns. And our role, uh, if anything, uh, in all of this is, is to help our clients to learn about the relationship. And we can do that by uh, sharing the evidence. And, uh, and so what, what that does um, for us is it, it reminds us that um, we need to work within our boundaries. Um, 
and within our within our competencies and within the limits of our role. Uh, we're all implicated in learning more about mental health, um, and uh, we need to learn more about the relationship between career development and mental health. And there'll be more information uh, available as uh, in the near future, I imagine. And uh, we all need to find a way to link our clients to mental health resources. Okay. And on we go, Dave. And there we go. And so what's interesting, and we started the first poll was, you know, how aware are you about the mental health outcomes and, and thinking about those things? And, and, and you are. Um, and now we want to move to communication or the evaluation of these mental health outcomes in, in practice and how you communicate them. And we're gonna have one last poll. What's the main way you or your organization assess the mental health outcomes of your career development? And you'll see the options there. We add nothing, we use anecdotes, or we, we do pre and post kind of indicators. Give you 30 seconds for that. Okay, 40% have no measures, 43% use anecdotal or qualitative information, so stories, right? You keep notes in your client files, so there's 83%. And then 17% of you ask about mental health indicators before and after. This is the number we're hoping, uh, we being Michael and I, are hoping increases um, due to our book, partially, uh, due to workshops and, and due to spreading the word that it is important uh, to to measure this stuff and get it out. Now I'm going to go very quickly through some slides, but you'll get these slides later. Um, and and you can track these outcomes verbally. You know, just asking clients how how is your thinking or your feeling or your behaviors um, around the demands you're facing changed. You can do written surveys, and and in the book we have examples. You'll see uh, a, on the screen here um, examples. Um, and these are intended, these kinds of questions, you could just insert in whatever you're asking clients already. This doesn't have to be complicated. We're not looking for proof, we're looking for evidence. And those are, are different things. We just need to show that, that, yeah, we have information that says, you know, we make a difference. Um, you can do what are called post pre-surveys where after an intervention, you ask clients, how they were doing before and how they're doing now. So you do your pre and post, but after, that's a post pre. Um, and I'll, here's some examples, you know, you could throw in, right? Um, feeling hopeful about my future before, you know, was I acceptable, unacceptable? And if unacceptable, a zero or a one, uh, you know, was I almost acceptable? And then uh, the other decision is, okay, if, if I'm acceptable, was I just barely acceptable? Um, pretty solid or, or really exceptional. You can ask those things and look at the difference. And I want to show you uh, an example that Michael uses in a workshop he does with post-secondary students, university students, who um, take a, a you know a half-day workshop with them on career exploration. And so here's the survey he uses, and those are the the ten questions down the side. And you'll see this is just um, the the data from a, a sample where you'll see the before scores and most of them are under two on average and the after scores most of them are, are over three on or all of them are over three but here's the one i want you to pay attention to this one here um, is the second highest difference before and after difference in the 10 questions and notice the question hope and optimism about finding work i enjoy after graduation but the cool thing about this is Mike does not talk about hope. Mike does not talk about optimism in this workshop. Those terms never come up. The workshop is about how to, you know, identify what your strengths are, what your values are, how you start researching those out in the world of work and looking at options. The whole workshop's 
a pretty procedural one about career development. Mm -hmm. And yet the second highest difference score is hope and optimism. It's this sort of thing that, that our field would do well to measure. Because then you get administrators, stakeholders, et cetera, um, who actually influence our funding, influence policy um, to pay attention to what we're doing. And so on the communication side, um, you know, Margaret Wheatley, a, a leadership expert, has this great phrase, right? All social change starts with a conversation. And so, you know, we have, we have questions about, so who needs to know that your work has a mental health impact? And how can you engage them in that conversation? And what evidence can you bring, you know, in terms of actual sort of numbers? But then don't forget stories. Um, numbers are good. Stories are, are, are better for certain things. Depends what you're trying to do. And I, I guess what we'd encourage you to do is collect, collect data, uh, whether story or evidence, uh, um, sorry, numbers, and, and um, start thinking about, does your boss know about this stuff? Do your funders know about this? Does your board of directors know the kinds of things you're achieving? And ultimately, for many of you who work you know, by a government-sponsored initiatives, um, do the funders, like the actual policy makers, know that if they spend a dollar on career development, then maybe they're saving some money on the mental health side? And, and that's the point of this. And obviously, I've gone through this very quickly, but, but I'm, I'm sure you, you get the sense of this. People can't endorse career development as a mental health outcome producer if they don't know it, and if we actually don't have the information to provide it. So with that, we're, we're gonna to move to the, the Q&A in just one second. I just wanna summarize. Uh, and, and the summary is this. By virtue of being a career development practitioner, you're already bolstering your client's mental health and in a number of ways. And one common way, no matter what your practice is, one common way you're, you're doing that is by helping them manage their stress a little more effectively. And it's not that stress is a bad thing, but pers persistent, long-term excessive stress is harmful. And, and you help clients with that. And, and then the third main message is um, the world needs to hear this because um, the, the, um, the mental health movement doesn't see that we contribute, uh, it seems. And the mental health movement also, uh, at least in Canada, doesn't do what we do um, their focus tends to be on the managing stress rather than the coping side. And what we bring to the equation as a field is the coping side. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to questions and I wanna to thank you very much for joining us. And Cyril, you've got the questions. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Mike, uh, for your presentation. And then you're right, it's now time for the questions. So we, for those of you who haven't sent the question yet, you can still do it by using the question box you see on your screen. So let's start. Uh, and before asking the first question, I want to share the comment from Vicky, who said, it is incredibly relevant to even the coaching conversation I had this morning with a leader in the private sector. I love it. Thank you, Vicky, for your comments. All right, so we will start with the question uh, from Laurie. What factors are involved in perception of being able to cope? Michael, that's for you. I think it's a, it's a stress stress related question. So, so it's the um, we didn't actually. This is the weeds part. We didn't get into this in the model, but um, but uh, but there's an appraisal mechanism that that. That both uh, that looks at the the size of the demand and how important it is in our it, the, when we think about it, and we also appraise at the same time our capacity for for coping with it and uh, and um, the um, the the uh, okay, uh, the question again, Syria, what factors were? I'm gonna and I will answer the question. What factors were for the coping? What factor involved when uh, when we cope? Yeah. So 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 the um, so so it, it's good if if uh, it's it helps if perception aligns with with reality somewhat and uh, and it it's oh it's okay to uh, to be facing a demand and to not uh, 
to to not know how um, how 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 you or how your client's going to to cope with it. Um, but the the factor the factors uh, I think that the factor is have, having a having a access to uh, to an opportunity to develop skills or to bring in resources for for coping with it and. Uh, and uh, and, it, and and I guess just you based on that model, changing the relationship between the demands and the coping resource, or the relationship, the changing the perception about the relationship, right? To the mm -hmm. to the point that uh, that we actually we think that we'll be able to manage the demands that we're facing. Did Thank that you. answer the, the question? I guess we won't know, will we? But. <laughs> Let's take another question. So I have a question from Yas, uh, and she's asking, when teaching clinical psychology students, how do you communicate the relevancy of career development competency? Students sometimes say, I don't plan to be a career counselor, so it is not relevant to me. You know, uh, can I answer that one, Mike? Yeah, please. Yeah. When I was in graduate school uh, doing my master's in counseling, which was a very long time ago, um, the field of career counseling was seen as something you did if you couldn't cut it as a therapist. And I think that mentality is still out there, that, that people somehow dismiss the, the career side of, of counseling and therapy. Um, and I think part of that is created by our own field because we created this, this um, sense that you could fix everything with a test, you know? Um, throw them a strong Campbell interest inventory and everything will be fine. And of course, that's not true. And so what we have to do, um, and there's a section on this in our book, but what we have to do with the, the mental health people, the psychologists, is, is help them see where they're missing some things because they don't often ask about work uh, specifically, um, but also just the, the bare facts of how much time people spend at work and, and how much um, that time actually spins off to the rest of their lives, like the effects of that time. And then you can always go back to the fundamentals, right, of, of people like Freud or Viktor Frankl or, or whoever you, you admire. You know, almost any serious psychologist, um, theorist, talks about work as, as one of the fundamentally central things that, that humans have to deal with. And so to leave it out of psychotherapy and counseling uh, just doesn't make sense. There's more in the book on that, though. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Amanda is asking, though each client's level of readiness for service is unique, is accessing mental health or counseling support in tandem with career support often more effective than doing it separate times? Uh, Mike, I'll take a stab. You can correct me. Okay. Um, this is something that we're still trying to figure out. The research isn't entirely clear on that. Um, but it, and, and having said that, it, it just seems to me that to do things in tandem, if the mental health professional knows what's going on with the career side and vice versa, to a certain degree, not all the details, um, doing it in tandem would make all sorts of sense because it would help the client make connections that neither the, practitioner, the career practitioner or the mental health uh, professional are making. Um, and there is this, uh, I guess I, idea out there is that you know there's a sort of sequence to getting clients ready. That first you have to deal with their 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 problems, and then then you have to you know teach them basic skills, et cetera. And there's some evidence that that's not true. That you can actually get them get clients doing things, and then once they're doing things, start working on all the things that are barriers, whether that's mental illness or addictions or 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 whatever it is. So. The short answer is we we don't know a solid answer to that. <laughs> was a tough one. We have received so many great questions. Thank you all for for your engagement. But let's take the the last one for today, um, which might be a tough one as well. Doris is asking how to fight back to the myth about mental health equal craziness. Oh, Michael. <laughs> is that so? The question was how how to fight every talk. It's a question about stigma. I think if I heard it properly. Yeah, how it. to how to fight back to the myths about mental health yeah. and craziness. Yeah, well, I'll just say so. Dave Dave referenced it um, 
what one part of it is is uh, when when we uh, when we hear mental health, we uh, we uh, we think uh, mental illness. And I think the uh, my, my argument would be that it is uh, that it's it's work we still need to do, and uh, that even today in 2020, st stigma is alive and real, and we still we still need to to deal with it. And uh, career development practitioners, I think, can play a role in that as well by by bringing mental health into our conversations and by by uh, by talking about what we do as a support for positive mental health. Um, but um, but I don't know if I have an answer for how how to fight that. But I appreciate it as a as a worthwhile question, and uh, <laughs> and and think we we need to keep working on that. Sure, thank you. Uh, and yeah, that was the last question for today. It was again really great to see all those questions coming through the webinar. So thank you all for your engagement. I'm sorry we didn't get it. Dave and Michael, thank you for your presentation today. It was really interesting and important to learn more about the effect of career development on mental health and how our practice can have positive impact on it. And I'm sure we all appreciate the different example you shared on how to address that with our clients. So thank you for sharing that with us. You Thanks can learn that. more about the Strengthening Mental Health through Effective Career Development Guide, including how to download a free PDF or purchase a print copy at seric.ca slash cdmh. And because you might want to continue your learning journey with other webinars, I'm happy to share a few upcoming ones that the CEREC is offering in the next few weeks. You can join the 30-minute conversation we will have with Shelley Deloyer next Thursday, where we will address questions and concerns on how to manage our mental and emotional well-being. This conversation follows the webinar series we just wrapped up yesterday and for which all the recordings are available on our website. If you want to join the conversation, you will need to register for the webinar. We are also going to have a paid webinar series called the Career Development Professional's Guide to Effectively Serving Clients Living on the Autism Spectrum, presented by Sarah Teller and in partnership with CASE, the Canadian Association for Supported Employment. And finally, we also have a free series with four of the authors of the CERC book, Career Theories and Model at Work with John Wooden from Australia, Louis Cornoyer and Simon Vivier from Canada, and David Blosting from US. Please visit our website at seric.ca slash webinars for more information or to register. And don't forget to subscribe to our webinars news to stay informed of new webinars opportunities. Now it's time for you to tell us what you thought of this webinar today and about your future learning needs and how we can best support you. So please take a few minutes and share your answer with us in the pop-up survey that you will see on your screen. Thank you in advance for your feedback. Let me now close by thanking you, the participant, for being so many with us today and for your great engagement. Thank you for joining us today and we hope to see you at another learning opportunity. Have a good day.